Good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Tuesdays, which is a monthly webinar series that's offered to you or brought to you by the Washington State Library. Um, we have just a little bit of housekeeping to start with. I wanted to tell you, oopsie, what just happened there. I, I'm Nona Burling, I'm your facilitator, which basically means I'm introducing everything. We have um, two people on line right now for technical support, Jeremy Stroud and Joe Olivar. If you guys wouldn't mind putting your contact information into the chat box, that way if anyone is having any trouble, they'll, they can give you a call and get some help. Though since we've changed software, it seems like it's a pretty, um, we're having a lot less technical difficulty, which is great. Um, a couple of things at the very end of the um, webinar, when you close down the window, you'll see that there is a survey that should pop up on your in your browser. And that survey is we need to do for our funder, which is the Institute of Museum and Library Services. So if you have the time, it's just four questions. It should be really quick. Um, let's see. And then I want to say that this is brought to you by the Washington State Library and the Institute of Museum and Library Services, our funder. And I was going to introduce our panelists to you. They have suggested that I just say their name. They're going to introduce themselves during the course of the webinar. They've requested that um, if you have questions during the presentation, you put them in the chat box. They'll try during the presentation to reply in chat. And then at the end, they can um, answer any questions out loud. But please add your questions as we go. So I, we have Sunny Kim, Micah Carine, Bean Yogi, and Reed Garber Pearson are our four presenters. And that's all for me. And I would say, take it away, guys. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, while we're getting the slide into present mode, uh, I just wanted to thank you all for showing up and joining us today. Um, I know it's hard to carve time out uh, for more learning and development, but I appreciate that you all are here for this. Um, and the second thing I'd like to do before introducing ourselves is um, acknowledge that the land on which the presenters live is the occupied, unceded, and seized territory of the Duwamish people and the Coast Salish tribes that have stewarded this region since before settler colonialism. And we want to go beyond just a statement and urge you all to be guided by this knowledge in your relationship to whatever land you are currently live on, living on. Um, so with that, have, having said that, uh, let's start with Reed introducing themselves. Hi, this is Reed speaking. Good morning, everyone. Um, and Reed and Bean and I are, we're both on the same mic right now, so we'll be trying to introduce ourselves as we're on mic so you know who is speaking. Um, so this is Reed, and I'm the online learning librarian and a social sciences librarian at the University of Washington. Hello, I'm Micah Carine. Um, Sunny and I are actually also sharing a mic, so we will try to introduce ourselves as we go. Um, I work for the Seattle Public Library, and I'm a library associate for their meaning I staff and information desk. Hi there, uh, I'm Sunny Kim. I also work at the Seattle Public Library as a teen services librarian. Um, and uh, just the one thing I like to share with folks uh, is that before joining libraries, I worked in community organizing in Seattle. So that informs a lot of uh, what I bring to my library work. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bean Yogi. I also use they, them, and their pronouns. And I'm a library associate too at the Seattle Public Library. I see that someone commented that the slides are uh, showing up in larger than the screen. Is anyone else having issues with that? Or uh, is that perhaps just a, an issue with one computer? Okay. And does uh, Jeremy's fix typed into the chat box address the issue? Double clicking on the screen. No, it does not. Okay, so 
Maybe. So it's looking half and half. I'm seeing. Okay, a how bunch. about now? Now it's great. Yes. Okay. Oh yeah. Great. Excellent. All right. It looks like it. <laughs> the issue has been addressed. All right. Sorry. So um, to wrap up our intros, all of us use the pronouns they, them, and theirs. Uh, and uh, yeah. You may notice that we also included it in our Zoom um, chat name. Um, this is a practice that I've started to do because there are so few ways to share with people what pronouns uh, you are using. So anyway, take it away, Reed. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about what we're gonna do today. This is a very, very brief session of uh, a very introductory session. So today's all about increasing our understanding of transgender experiences um, in order to create library spaces and programming that are truly inclusive of and reflect the wide variety of gender expressions and experiences that of our patrons and our coworkers that use our library spaces. Um, We'll offer some ideas and some starting points for resources and programming, but really today is meant to get you to start thinking about um, your own institutions and libraries and the context in which you work and to identify some areas that you might wanna, wanna work on um, in your own landscape. Um, so hopefully, if anything today, you'll come out with some questions um, that you can take back to your own institution um, and start to um, do some work within you. And we're always open to talking further about this later. Okay, and we've created some ground rules um, since this is such a brief session today. We did a very um, long four hour workshop of the same session at the Washington Library Association Conference last year, November, 2017. So this is like 50 minutes of um, very basics. So these are really meant to help us have some common understandings together when we ask questions and answer them. So obviously respect is, is a guideline that we'd like to have with one another today. Speak from your own experiences and perspectives, please, um, when you ask questions. Um, and respect people's pronouns. We all make mistakes and you have probably made mistakes. I make mistakes. We'll all continue to make mistakes. But I think the most important thing to learn today is to correct yourself and to own those mistakes and to take responsibility for them. And we will talk more about how to apologize when we make these mistakes. And we'll give you some, um, some helpful little tips about, about that. Thank you, Reed. This is Micah again. Um, so one of the things that felt really important to me as we were doing this presentation is making sure that we had shared language. So, um, I'm sure all of you have heard of LGBT, um, kind of a more full acronym is LGBTQQIA. Um, so what does that mean? So what this uh, acronym stands for is all different folks in the queer community. Um, that includes folks that are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, and asexual. I'm sure some of those words are new. Um, and what we are gonna talk about today um, is um, particularly the identities that uh, have to do with gender identity versus sexual orientation. Um, so uh, the identities that have to do with uh, gender identity versus sexual orientation um, is of course primarily transgender. That uh, word refers to folks that identify uh, with a gender identity other than the one that was assigned to them at birth. Um, it also applies to some folks that are queer, some folks that are questioning. And I realized when we reformatted this that I'm actually missing an arrow. Um, and so I'd like to, for you all to imagine an arrow pointing towards the word intersex. Um, and that is, um, oh, are you able to move it live, Sunny? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Um, so what we are, so what with queer, that is a word that has to do with uh, both sexual orientation and gender identity. It's a word that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of people. Um, it's also used as an umbrella term to refer to the whole uh, 
LGBT community often. Um, it is a word that has been reclaimed by a lot of folks in the community after it being a word that has been used against us. Um, the word questioning, that is a word that refers to folks that are still kind of examining what either their sexual orientation or gender identity or both is. Um, and then as for intersex, um, that is a population of folks um, whose uh, genetics, whose chromosomes, whose uh, genitalia and whose kind of like hormones uh, are not um, in alignment with what medical standards uh, assign to a binary gender, so male or female. Um, it's actually about 2% of the population. I'm going to go into more detail about this on the next slide. Um, so just to give you all a heads up of which words we're going into today and kind of what this means in the scheme of the LGBTQ community. So definitions, I was getting a little ahead of myself. Uh, you know, it's 9 a.m. on a Tuesday morning. So let's dive deeper. Um, so transgender individuals have a gender identity that differs from their assigned sex at birth, um, meaning that they identify differently other than what's on their birth certificate. Um, the word cisgender, that is the opposite of transgender. It's not a bad word, um, it's just a descriptor. And that's for folks that have a gender identity that does align with the, uh, the sex that they were assigned at birth. So for example, uh, that would be someone who was born, the doctor wrote female on their birth certificate, and you know, they're, they still identify as a woman. That is all that cisgender means. So diving into tran what uh, transgender identities look like a little more deeply, a transgender man, you might hear someone refer to that person as a trans man. That person was assigned female at birth, um, but his gender identity is that of a man. Um, he lives as a man. Um, he is a man. Um, a transgender woman, on the other hand, or a trans woman, was assigned male at birth, um, but she is a woman. Um, her gender identity is that of a woman. Um, and yeah, that's, that's her. So sometimes folks get a little mixed up with those terms. So I like to kind of delineate which means what. Um, a gender queer or non-binary person may have been assigned any gender at birth. Um, and that, that is a very uh, kind of a different sort of umbrella term that includes a wide variety of identities for folks that do not identify either as a man or a woman. Um, and so they might identify not as either gender, both gender simultaneously, meaning they feel both like a man or a woman, or fluctuate between gender identities um, in a gender fluid way. Um, and then one other part of this is folks who are gender non-conforming. So that um, would be someone who is cisgender, who um, identifies with the gender they were assigned at birth, um, who perhaps in a good example of this would be um, someone who was assigned male at birth, who really identifies as a man, but like loves wearing dresses and painting his nails. In our society, that would be considered gender non-conforming. So I know I just put a lot of text out there for y'all um, and kind of talked at you for a minute. And I want to illustrate what this looks like using myself as an example. So this is the gender unicorn. Um, this is a graphic by the Trans Student Educational Resources. Um, and they share this just to kind of give folks an idea of what this looks like um, in action. So you'll see the little rainbow that represents gender identity. So you can see that's what the unicorn is thinking about. That's what's, um, that's what's in the brain. That's uh, kind of what you feel. Um, you'll see gender expression. That's the green and the dots on the outside. That is how you um, express, how you show your gender. Those are kind of the adornments of gender, what you wear, um, but also like how you walk and how you physically take up space in the world. Um, sex assigned at birth, you'll see the chromosome sign for that. Um, that is, uh, has to do with, you know, chromosomes and uh, genitalia and uh, hormones. Um, and then you'll see the different hearts for physical and emotional attraction. This delineates that, you know, some folks have different physical and emotional attraction to different folks of different genders. So let me dive in. So I'm using myself as an example. Um, this is something that is a pretty cool way to explore on your own and really think through how you identify, how you express yourself um, and the attractions you experience. So for me, 
I identify very strongly as genderqueer or non-binary. Um, so that is my only gender identity. For me, I feel like I'm not either gender. Um, other non-binary folks might mark this completely differently. Obviously, we are all different. My gender expression. So y'all saw one little photo of me. Um, so let me talk through that. So I mostly feel like my gender expression is other, but I recognize that it also uh, peeks into both things that are feminine and masculine. Y'all cannot see me today, but I'm wearing nail polish and mascara. So those are things that kind of are societally assigned to feminine. Um, I'm also, I think all of the clothing I'm wearing is men's clothing. So that is something that is societally assigned as masculine. Um, and this, you know, can be fluid. I'm a huge fan of floral print. So depending on when you see me, um, my gender expression might look differently, but this is kind of a snapshot for me of how I feel my gender expression plays out in the world, meaning the physical adornments I uh, share with my body and the way I move my body. Um, sex assigned at birth. So this is something you never under any circumstances want to ask um, trans folks about. Um, but because we're all friends here, I'm going to share this information about myself. But again, this is something you don't want to ask. Um, I was assigned female at birth. And that is um, just kind of a piece of information that I share to make this graphic make a little more sense. Um, and then to kind of delineate the difference between gender identity and attraction, um, just briefly speaking to my own physical attractions and emotional attractions, just to kind of bring this back into the larger picture of how sexual orientation and gender identity are different. So for me, um, I'm physically attracted primarily to other trans individuals, but also men and women. Um, and my emotional attractions are a little bit different. I am, again, incredibly attracted to other trans folks emotionally, um, and then also men and women. And you'll see that that differs a little bit for me um, between physical and emotional attraction. All right, up next, we have uh, Bean, and I'm gonna mute myself over here. Hello, everyone, this is Bean. Um, I just wanna walk you through really quickly um, some information that we hope will demystify trans and non-binary identities. Um, questions that we get a lot in the work that we do is, you know, like, well, what, um, what are some realities of, for trans people and what should I know um, and keep in mind about non-binary identities? And I think what I wanna start off by saying is that um, sometimes we, we really want there to be like hard and fast truths about, um, identities that we're not familiar with to kind of make it easier for us to understand them. But um, what you'll hear us say a lot and what I'll say a lot in this slide um, is that it's, you know, people's experiences individually are really different. Um, and just like any other social group, um, trans folks are not a monolith. So just wanted to say that um, and really go over the fact that um, when it comes to uh, trans and non-binary people, um, we, we understand that part of um, individual people's transitions um, socially, uh, in, you know, involve things like uh, changing your name and changing your pronouns from what they were assigned to you when you were born. Um, it may involve uh, changing how you present your um, uh, gender identity so that, you know, um, you might have been uh, pressured or forced to wear certain kinds of clothes or um, to style your hair in a certain way. Um, part of some people's um, gender transition involves um, taking more self-determination uh, in that respect. Um, another aspect of transition that some trans people um, choose to go through is um, what we sort of broadly call a medical transition. Um, and that means, you know, on some levels engaging with um, the medical industrial complex to um, receive hormone replacement therapy, um, to uh, maybe invest in gender confirming surgeries. What we really wanna emphasize about this aspect of transitioning and what that means is that um, it doesn't look the same for any two trans people. Um, you don't need to undergo medical transitioning in order to be trans or in order to be non-binary. And also that I think um, there, it, it, trans people uh, often will um, 
receive questions about, you know, what their transition involves, what it looks like. Have you had any surgeries? Are you on any hormones? And those are just like any other medical decision, like extremely personal. So um, we wanted to say, you know, we wanted to go over that and name that as um, just one aspect of transition that some people choose to go through, um, but also encourage all of us not to, uh, not to inquire about those things. Um, unless, of course, uh, a person has decided to share that information with you. Um, one other thing we wanted to say is that um, there's a very popular narrative in media, um, in the ways that we talk um, more broadly about trans experience, to say that um, you know that you're trans because you feel that you were born in the wrong body. And uh, that just isn't the case for some trans people. Um, and it's good to understand that that is sometimes people's experience and that that is um, something that can cause a lot of uh, emotional and social anguish, but um, that it's not good to assume. Uh, let's see, hopefully it goes without saying, but um, there was a point where um, many medical professionals considered being trans uh, to be a mental illness, which um, is not, not the case. Um, not that there's anything wrong with having mental illnesses or that that should bring about the social stigma that it does, um, but really that being trans is a very human experience. And if you were to Google <laughs> third gender and uh, click on the Wikipedia page for that, uh, for that search, you would see that actually many societies around the world, um, particularly indigenous societies, have conceptualized a third gender um, and have always understood that um, gender is not simply a binary. Um, so if you're interested in knowing more about what um, non-binary identities can look like outside of specifically a US context, that might be a good thing to, uh, to check out. And last but not least, um, racism, classism, ableism, and other forms of oppression impact the access that um, we have to gender affirming healthcare and that using the legal system to change legal documents is um, something that some trans people choose to do and sometimes is, um, is not possible for a whole host of reasons. Um, so what, we, what our legal documents say about us is not always what's true about us. Um, and that's something that we'll touch on a little bit in the context of our work in libraries. Okay, so now we would like to invite you to um, share in the chat um, based on what you've heard us say, based on maybe what you've been reflecting on in terms of uh, how to be more um, centering of trans people in our work. Um, why, why do you feel that um, discussing these issues of gender and reflecting on trans inclusion for libraries is important for us as library staff? So don't be shy. Go ahead and um, pop your ideas into uh, the webinar chat. And as some of you are reflecting and perhaps typing and deleting and retyping, um, oh, there we go. Okay, so some of the things that um, are popping up in the chat include um, better serving the community, not misgendering our patrons and colleagues, um, wanting to uh, be supportive and not, um, not offending people, um, wanting to support the kids in our lives, um, creating welcoming and safe space in our libraries, um, knowing what to do when we overhear our coworkers and friends um, speaking insensitively about trans people. Um, and yeah, and centering trans folks in the workplace, um, which can help us center trans people in our communities. I think that's a really important one. Um, I'm seeing lots of, lots of suggestions, lots of ideas. Keep them coming. Um, we are gonna, we're gonna share a few that we think are really important that really, um, I think actually reflect what some of you are saying. Um, I think, uh, oh, okay. Um, yes, as many of you have mentioned, um, we, 
our goal as library workers is to make libraries safer for all of our patrons. Um, and this is one easy way with a little bit of practice that we can um, do that and incorporate better um, policies, procedures. Um, another is to avoid unintentionally escalating situations. Um, and yeah, I, maybe I won't um, read all of these out loud since you can see them. But one thing that I really wanted to highlight is to say that, um, you know, libraries are not, we don't exist in a vacuum and um, trans people inside of libraries, outside of them are regularly misgendered um, in our everyday lives. And when we make a mistake about gender in just one instance, um, we like to think of it as perhaps accidentally stepping on someone's broken toe. Um, you might not have done it on purpose. You might not have been the first or the only person to have stepped on that toe, but um, it doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt when you do it. Um, and because of how our larger society thinks of and treats trans and non-binary people, we, um, we just want to make our libraries one, one place where that happens um, less often. <laughs> Okay, so this is read again, and I'm not going to go through all of these options um, since we are limited on time, but I did want to show you this slide to um, give you some ideas and options for um, language when you're referring to coworkers or patrons as individuals or as, as large groups. I think that um, when we're talking, a lot of us, myself included, have a tendency to um, say, hey guys, uh, or um, if, you're, um, if you're trying to be very, um, uh, very polite with people, I think a lot of people like to use sir and ma'am when referring to patrons. Um, but I think what I want to stress today is that it's more polite to not misgender somebody than to use like honorary terms like sir and ma'am. Um, in your language with people. And we've said this a couple times, but I think it's worth reiterating is that you never know somebody's pronouns or gender identity until you ask. You can't assume by what people look like, and especially in groups. Um, that, that means that we have to really change the way we use our language with people. So there's some really easy ones, like simply, hi everyone, or hi folks. Um, you all, you know, those are very easy. Get creative with your language. Um, but yes, somebody said the power of regional language, y'all. Yes, I use y'all all the time. I don't think a lot of people here in the Northwest do, but I love y'all. <laughs> <laughs> um, addressing individuals, just saying, excuse me, you don't have to have a pronoun in there. Hello there. Um, ideas for children, hi friend or hi reader. There's so many ways. I'm a big fan of using folks. I call people folks a lot, Bean's next to me saying, mm hmm <laughs> So yeah, um, there, there's so many language options. And I think it can be the most inclusive thing that you can do. And I think the one thing that you can do is change your language um, with people. Um, never assume, never, never put pronouns on people until you ask or if, unless you already know. And so um, these are on the slides and I would encourage you to spend some time with these after the web webinar um, and practice. I think a really great thing to do is to look in the mirror <laughs> and like talk to yourself as if you're talking to other people. Um, you can also get a buddy and be like, hey, can I practice using these words with you? Um, and the only way you're ever gonna get it is by just like reiterating it to yourself. Mm -hmm. So just getting in front of the mirror and saying, good morning, y'all. <laughs> um, it sounds really stupid, but um, I've done it a lot. And I have a lot of people in my life that regularly change pronouns. And this is the way that I make sure that I'm keeping myself accountable to changing my pronouns as my friend's pronouns change, mm -hmm. is that I, I practice and I do it in front of a mirror and I practice with my friends. Mm -hmm. And before we move on, this has been, um, since we have a little bit of time, I just, uh, one thing that I wanted to highlight that I know some of you have mentioned in the, in the chat, um, and I think really um, speaks to the heart of what we're getting at when we talk about uh, really implementing and committing to implementing gender inclusive language, um, is that when we do that with our patrons, 
hopefully we'll also be doing that with each other, with um, our colleagues. Um, and doing that, I think, will not only strengthen our public service, but it will also strengthen our internal organizational cultures. Um, and what, how I like to think of that is um, that when we talk about in the field of library sciences, wanting to diversify, wanting to see more um, black and brown people, more um, trans and gender nonconforming people, um, more people with disabilities, like, you know, being in our profession and finding a home in our profession. I mean, the only way that we can do that is by creating that space together. Um, and so when, you know, Reed's suggesting that you practice um, gender inclusive language and doing that on your own and doing that with friends, um, we hope we hope that you'll also um, make the vulnerable move of inviting your colleagues to do that with you because, I mean, for one thing, it will um, strengthen the internal organizational culture wherever you are, absolutely. But, um, you know, the person that you are speaking to on your team may be a trans person who hasn't felt safe enough or comfortable enough to um, share their gender identity with you and making uh, real concrete steps to um, inviting more gender in inclusive language into your workplace will just make it um, a safer place for everybody, including uh, each other as, as coworkers. Yeah, thank you, Bean. That's a really great point. Um, okay, so this next slide, this one, um, <laughs> is um, I've heard, I've seen some on the chat today. Um, people are asking, when is it appropriate to ask about pronouns? or there has, have been expressions of fear of getting pronouns wrong and so not asking. And that's really common. I just wanna um, say that a lot of people feel that and, and that's great that you're sharing that. So thank you all for sharing that. This slide is for you and me and all of us. Um, mistakes happen. Um, so I just wanna talk a little bit about some ways that we can apologize that might feel good. Um, I can speak from my own personal experience in that when people have gotten my pronouns wrong um, and they have made a big deal of it, there are some really bad ways that you can apologize. Um, and it's pretty harmful and pretty hurtful when people apologize in ways that um, center other people's experiences rather than the person like myself who might be getting misgendered. So these are just some guidelines. I would encourage you again to practice this with people, ask a friend, um, for consent in misgendering them. <laughs> we did this in our workshop. It worked out really well. Ask somebody for consent to misgender them and then practice um, misgendering them and apologizing. Figure out what your way of apologizing is. But here are some guidelines. So make the apology really brief, but genuine. It doesn't have to be lengthy. And I think that's the first thing that people do is make it a really lengthy apology, try to tell you why it happened and they're so sorry and oh, they're such a bad person. And it doesn't make you a bad person to misgender somebody at all. Um, it's, it's really, it really happens all the time. You're not a bad person for doing it. But make your apology brief, don't make it about you and make it really genuine. Um, again, move on, move on from that apology and um, I think this is really important. Don't ask trans folks to correct yourself, to correct you. Mm -hmm. um, take, it, uh, take it upon yourself to, to correct yourself when you know that you've made a mistake or you think you've made a mistake. Um, and the only way that you'll know if, if you're not sure is if you ask. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't always need to know somebody's pronouns. So somebody asked, you know, when is it appropriate to ask? You don't always need to know. So ask yourself, do I actually need to know the pronouns of this person? If you really do, or if you uh, gendered a person and you think that you'd like to know if you misgendered them, it's totally appropriate to ask. Um, and there's a lot of times where I'll tell somebody my pronouns and they'll be like, oh, um, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'll get it wrong. Um, and that, I'm, I, I do it a lot in professional spaces because um, I think that's what's asked of me in professional spaces, but I would love to change that. <laughs> I would love for people to not ask me to correct them, and I would love for them to correct themselves. Mm -hmm. And so this is, this is an offering for all of you. Correct yourself, don't ask the people in your life uh, to correct you. Um, and again, don't make assumptions about people, it really just digs the hole deeper. Um, and learning from your mistakes is a really important piece. So 
we're going to model some of this for you. Um, and you're going to hear Micah and Sunny and Bean um, give several scenarios of um, Micah being misgendered. And again, Micah uses they, them pronouns. And you're first going to hear Sunny and Micah. Um, and Sunny's going to give an apology. And then we're going to hear Bean give a different apology. And I would just um, like to welcome all of you to listen to how these are presented. Great. This is Micah. Um, so I'm just going to give a little background for our scenario here. So I am working at the information desk at my usual branch, and there are two volunteers, um, one being Sunny and one being Bean, and they misgender me in a conversation. Um, and they're both separately going to apologize to me, so they're not going to know how the other one apologized. Um, and so we're going to give examples and then I'm going to let you know at the end how they made me feel. And I'm also going to give an example of another good apology I actually received yesterday that I really appreciated. So this is Sunny's apology for misgendering me. Hey, Micah. Um, I just, I, I really, um, I'm so sorry. I'm really upset right now because earlier I called you he and, you know, like, I'm not a bad person, but like, this is so hard. It's so hard for me to remember that you use they. I mean, they is plural and I just, I don't really get it. But anyway, I'm really sorry and I hope you'll forgive me. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> I appreciate that, Sunny. So that's one example. And now being, you know, 10 minutes later is going to come up um, and also apologize for using he pronouns for me. Hey, Micah, I think I misgendered you a little bit ago. And yeah, I just wanted to say I'm sorry about it. I know you use they pronouns and I'll just use they pronouns for you from now on. So I hope that you all could hear the difference between those. Um, Bean's apology felt super grounding for me um, because they were brief about it. They acknowledged their mistake and they shared that they were going to do better in the future. Um, with Sunny's apology, it really felt like Sunny was asking for reassurance, that they wanted me to remind them that they're not a bad person for making a mistake, um, and really centered themselves in that of like, you know, I'm so upset, I can't believe I messed up, and also, you know, kind of discounted my identity by being like, oh, they is plural. Um, and so with that, um, those are two examples. I also wanted to share one more as we were kind of talking about sir and ma'am earlier. So this actually happened yesterday. I was chatting online with someone that I'm getting to know right now. Um, and he said to me, yes, ma'am, I like it. And then before I even had a chance to reply, said, shoot, sorry about the ma'am. I'm from the South. Um, and it was taught to me by my parents. It won't happen again. So that was a really great example of someone that I don't know super well, um, who made a mistake and immediately corrected themselves, actually before I even saw the initial message from them. Um, so that's just kind of another example of a good apology and how that, you know, the person just shared quickly that they made a mistake and that they were gonna do better in the future. So um, from here, it's actually me again. Um, uh, so give me one moment to change slides. There we go. Um, we're doing shared, con shared control of one screen and uh, it's tripping me up a little bit. So this is still Micah. Um, I wanted to share some additional best practices with you all um, because we've talked a little bit about how to apologize. Um, and in this, I'll also talk about how to uh, ask for pronouns or how to share your own pronouns because that came up in the chat. Um, so the first thing, and we've mentioned this, is do not assume gender ever. Because remember the gender unicorn, the gender identity was the rainbow in the head. So um, like no matter how well you know someone, you cannot know their gender identity unless they tell you about it. It's not something that's visible. Um, so you cannot assume gender because it's not, it's not visible. You can see gender expression, um, but that doesn't necessarily align with gender identity. Um, and then again, if someone tells you their pronouns, use them. Um, even if they're not around to hear, especially if they're not around to hear, use them when you're talking to other people, use them in writing, um, just practice. And it's something um, that uh, you can, um, you know, work on and get better at. 
Um, I see that someone asked in the chat if using they pronouns for folks who identify as male or female or a man or a woman is considered misgendering, um, and it can be, yes. Um, so um, sometimes I will default to using they pronouns if I um, really don't know someone's gender identity and I'm making, you know, kind of a passing thing, but also that's what we do when someone's like, oh, they forgot their wallet when we don't know, you know, we have no idea whose wallet it is. Um, so it's always best to ask, although, you know, sometimes at the library, um, you know, someone might leave their keys and you'll have seen them from a distance. You have no idea what their gender is. Um, and so it is sometimes appropriate, but if you know someone's pronouns, use them. So if someone tells you that their pronouns are she and her, use her for that person. If you don't know someone's pronouns, try to connect with them and ask, but obviously that's not going to be possible with all of our library patrons. One way that I navigate that is, you know, if I'm telling a colleague to go help someone, I'll say, can you go help that person in the green jacket um, over by the DVDs? Um, and my colleague will have a chance to go over and talk with that person. Um, and then um, I, okay, I want to make sure that I'm getting to all this because we still have some good, we still have some time ahead of us. So, um, is it helpful for cisgender folks to have their gender pronouns on their library name tag, email signature, Zoom chat name? Yes. Um, that normalizes asking for pronouns and sharing pronouns. Um, so that's really important. And while I'm on that subject, um, how to ask for and share your pronouns. So one way that I really appreciate and that I've seen a lot of our teen service librarians doing at the Seattle Public Library when they're working with like service learning, uh, young adults, um, they might, when they initially are introducing themselves, um, this is an example of my one of my colleagues at the Ballard branch that we have. Um, whenever she's doing programs, um, she'll say, hi, my name's Lynn, I use she, her pronouns. And that's a way for her to invite young folks to share their pronouns without putting them on the spot to do so. Um, and then um, if you want to ask someone's pronouns, another way of doing that is like, hi, I'm Micah, I use they, them pronouns. Um, what pronouns would you like me to use for you? Um, I like to say it like that because sometimes people might use different pronouns in different settings of their life. Perhaps they're not out at work or perhaps they, they you know, their parents won't use the correct pronouns for them. And so that's a way to ask folks. Um, and it's also kind of more affirming te uh, terminology than saying preferred pronouns because pronouns aren't preferred. They are the thing that folks use. Um, and so it can be good to just ask what are your pronouns? Um, and again, uh, as library employees, we might be putting um, folks on the spot. So it sometimes can be good to just volunteer your own. Um, and then folks can mirror your language. Um, getting back to the slides, it looks like we've kind of covered those related questions. Um, and I mentioned this with pronouns and gender. If someone t tells you their gender, use that gender to refer to them later. So, you know, if you are writing, you know, some sort of shift log or incident report and someone has told you um, that they identify as non-binary and let's say that person got their, you know, phone stolen and you're doing a report about it, um, you know, there's the gender thing, you can write, make sure to write in non-binary regardless of how that person's gender expression is. Um, and then kind of another note about inclusive words. Um, the words transgender and trans are words that are um, currently the most inclusive words to use. Obviously, language always changes. So, you know, five years from now, everything we're telling you, not everything, but some of the stuff we're telling you probably won't be current anymore. Um, but those are words that are always followed by nouns. So you don't say a transgender, it's a transgender person. Um, a, like trans folks versus, um, I guess just saying the trans is. So, um, they, <laughs> what member the mayor? Oh, yes. So, the mayor of Seattle actually uh, recently made a mistake about this at a library training. Um, so, yes, uh, you want to make sure that you uh, follow this so that you don't get groans from an audience of 700 library employees. Just saying. Um, and then two really more important facts, um, and this is more about when you're interacting with trans individuals. 
do not under any circumstances ask them about the particulars of their, of their body or the surgeries they've had or want to have or any you know, medical things that they're doing with their transition. That's information that that individual can share with you if you want to, but um, that, like, how would you feel if someone asked you about your genitals? Um, it's a pretty inappropriate thing to ask. Um, and similarly, don't ask them what their birth name is or ever use it if you happen to know what it is. Um, it is incredibly disrespectful. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Sunny for the next slide. Oh, um, oh okay, great. One more question. Um, transgendered. Um, that is uh, actually not a word. So let's think about this um, in terms of other identities. Um, so let's see, Sunny, can you support me in this? I'm spacing on my You don't example. say uh, you got gayed or, you know, it's like transgender is not a verb, an act, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Is that what you were Yeah, that on? is. Um, that is exactly where I was going. So if you think about it, it's not something that happened to you. It's a part of who you are. Um, so transgender with the ED um, at the end, not a word and can, um, can really rub folks the wrong way. Um, and then, yes, um, you don't say that someone got feminine. Um, you would say that someone is dressing femininely that day. Um, just a different part of speech. Okay. Um, and it looks like there's some good information um, about um, the GLAD media guide that they put out. Um, and that's actually something that they continue to update and that shares terms and their definition and kind of appropriate settings for using them. Um, now I will turn it over to Sunny. Okay. Uh, so, uh, we don't have that much time, but we did want to talk about what, um, aside from your one-on-one -on -one interactions with patrons in the library or with your coworkers, um, what is this? Uh, what else does this look like for your uh, work within the library? Um, so we want we have some basic uh, guidelines, but uh, if folks want to also chime in with things that they've done or um, have seen other people do in libraries, uh, please do share in the chat box. So. The first thing is just um, don't segregate uh, queer and trans inclusion to just the one month of the year. And this applies for every marginalized group. Like if you're doing a display once a year for XYZ type of person and that type of person is never seen in any of your other uh, work throughout the year, that is a huge problem. Don't do that. Um, so this goes for book displays, collection development, when you are recommending books, um, the what books you face out in on your shelves, uh, the choices you make for story times, um, the types of uh, teen programming that you center, all of this, um, all of these areas are, uh, should include as many different types of voices from your community as possible. Um, and the, but the second point is when you're actually thinking about uh, which stories to include, please, please, please be sure to center uh, books actually written by trans folks. Um, I can't tell you how hurtful it is to read a book that won a bajillion awards from uh, entirely cisgender award panels that actually have harmful messaging. Um, uh, <laughs> and, and that has happened a lot, actually. So as much as you can, try and seek out um, reviewers who are trans um, and who are writing about books that are written by trans folks. Um, and those resources do exist out there. Uh, and, uh, next, this is like leveling up, um, if you want to think about it that way. Uh, if, you're, if you can do programming that actually includes input from the community, that is kind of like the, uh, a, a really good ultimate goal. Um, so for example, at Seattle Public Library, we've had a number of different programs that um, center the thinking and brilliance of queer and trans folks. Um, and, uh, and I want to actually turn it over to Micah to talk about a really fun program um, that they came up with for one of our branches. Yes, so I, until very recently, was working at the university branch of the Seattle Public Library, which is in the U District, and we um, have a lot of young adults that come into our branch, mostly uh, ages 18 through 26. 
Uh, so I um, am a member of the trans community here, and I was able to work with, you know, some of my community connections in conjunction with our young adult services librarian, Christy Gale, um, to put on a program that was part of the Translations Film Festival, um, which is actually the largest transgender film festival in the world. So what we did was an event called Trans Shorts and Speed Friending, and we've actually done a very similar event with the queer community one time before. Um, and what that involved was showing two shorts um, from the film festival. It was about 30 minutes of film time. Um, and we then did a speed friending program, which was an opportunity, kind of think speed dating, but instead of dating, um, imagine community connection. So um, we had 34 attendees. Um, our, uh, we had survey responses from two thirds of our attendees and they rated the program a nine and a half. Um, we primarily had, we had more than 50% uh, transgender attendees. Um, and then I think all but maybe one person who was an attendee identified in some way as LGBT. Um, so we were really able to connect with our, uh, our community and we did that by having connections with local organizations that are led by trans folks um, and this program um, because we partnered with them cost us fifty dollars for snacks and staff time um, and that was it and you know if we had gotten donations that for food um, it could have cost us significantly less um, so that was really awesome and it was the second time we've done it and it's been super successful back to sunny okay so um, the top three points are really about programs. And then the next two points are a lot about our policies and our facilities. So um, we went into this, it's much more depth than our four hour session. But what I wanna say here is basically, um, if you are asking your patrons for information, really think about why you need that information. So when we were doing our four hour session, we heard from some folks that their library system actually does um, put in a pronoun. Um, and we also learned that some systems um, are very strict about what name can be in there. So our system, if you are a young person, you can have uh, the name that you want to go by, whether it's your legal name or not. Um, if you're an adult, you can use an initial. Um, but those were changes that had to be fought for. Um, Micah, thank you so much for leading the charge on that. Um, but the the what we want to get at is that um, there are lots of ways in which our libraries actually create barriers for trans and gender non trans and non binary folks um, by asking for unnecessary information or by assuming information. Um, so as much as you can think about um, and challenge people in your institution like why are we collecting this do we need to collect this or if we do can we make it um, self determined, you know. So ask some of those questions. And then the next thing is facilities are really tough um, because for most people, you don't have the money to totally redo your building, right? So how are you going to um, accommodate trans folks? Um, so in Washington State, uh, legally, you are not allowed to question um, the bathroom of choice for folks, right? Yes, folks are legally allowed to use whatever restroom they feel most comfortable using, whichever um, whichever they feel most closely aligns with their gender identity. Um, and that is Washington state law. Um, and I know that when you're working in a library, sometimes you might have someone come up to you and be like, that person's in the, the wrong restroom, right? Um, and it's it, a lot of times they come at you because they're afraid, right? Um, and so sometimes it's like, yes, a cisgender person is in not the restroom they would normally use, but a, a lot of the times in my experience, it's been somebody who whose gender identity wasn't totally clear to that person and they were alarmed by it. So what do you do in that case, right? Well, you let the patron know who's complaining, like um, basically it's none of their business, but um, no, that, what's a nice way to do it? I don't do it very nicely. Yeah, so one, <laughs> way, is better. one way that I have framed this with folks is like, you know, we don't question the restroom um, that a patron uses. It's important that we, um, it's important to let folks use whatever restroom feels most comfortable to them. Um, you're welcome to use um, this restroom upstairs or wait until another time to use the restroom. Um, I will give that person an option, the person who's complaining an option to use a different restroom. I will, will not under any circumstances relocate the person um, who is using the restroom 
successfully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is using the restroom the, the way that they need to use it, right? They're just in there using the facility. Um, somebody in the chat, uh, sorry, your name got cut off, but um, mentioned that having maps or having an idea of where nearby gender inclusive bathrooms are or and or single stall restrooms, um, that would be helpful. So if you, you're on a campus, for instance, and the the, sing, the multi-stall single gendered restrooms are on one floor um, that most people go to, do you know where the other options are? And if you don't, find out. Um, and if you realize that the other options are super far away, is there any advocacy you can do with your university? Um, this is uh, totally different for public libraries where you have branches um, and most branches only have one set of restrooms. So, you know, what are the restrooms in your nearby community? I know that the, across the street from my branch, there's a Safeway that has a restroom, right? So what are the options for folks? Um, and then uh, the final point I want to make is uh, just that, um, and we brought this up earlier when we talked about intersecting oppressions like racism, ableism, um, classism. Um, just keep in mind that uh, people are not just trans, right? Like people are trans kids of immigrants like me. Um, people are, you know, like maybe they're a straight transgender person who uh, grew up poor. Like there are so many different ways our identities um, intersect and, and those different intersections actually really impact the uh, access and um, quality of um, service that people receive. And so to illustrate um, this example, uh, I can't, I mean like the people in my life who are black and brown um, and queer and have a disability have experienced the most horrific stories that I have heard from people, right? And it is because of those intersecting, intersecting identities that they have that much worse of an experience. And so when we're talking about trans inclusion, let's not stop at including um, privileged transgender folks, um, middle class, white transgender folks, college educated transgender folks. Let's really think about all of our community um, and, and uh, strive to include everybody. So yeah, I started rambling. And I think I'm done with my slides now. <laughs> yes. So we want oh yes oh sorry um and reed uh in the chat said intersectionality is actually a term coined by uh black legal scholar kimberly crenshaw when she was talking about the unique experience of black women um in the legal system and uh activists and organizers have really um taken that and helped guide um our work in the future um so prison abolitionists for instance have done a lot of thinking about intersectionality because how can the uh, uh, how can an unjust um, criminal legal system actually deliver justice for one person for one type of identity while creating tons and tons of harm for other identities right so um, it's something that helps us think about the complicated ways in, a, in which oppression um, intersects and causes different levels of um, oppression for folks so we recognize that we have three minutes left. Um, so if you all want to type in any questions that you have into the chat at this time, um, we will follow up um, and put our answers into the Google document. Um, we just wanna make sure that we have last minute uh, opportunity to get questions for folks. And I know that um, the folks from the Washington State Libraries want us to mention that you do have a uh, survey that will pop up when you close this window that's very important for their funding. Um, so please, please, please fill that out. Uh, let us know if you have any feedback, um, questions, um, and thank you for being here today. I and would like I to add uh, real quickly as far as the time goes. Um, we say the end is 10 o'clock. A lot of people have to get on the desk or the like. If you need to take a little more time to answer questions, uh, please feel free. We're recording everything. So if anybody does have to log off, they can access the recording later on to get access to those questions and the answer sessions. And this is Reed, and I just want to say that the um, tiny URL link we sent out that has all of the resources on it, um, there is something at the, there's some resources at the end with handouts that we had from our workshop um, that I think could be really useful. And there's one thing that we did in our workshop, which was an institutional policy review, um, which went over a lot of the different questions we asked you to think about, such as facilities and bathrooms. And I think that that can be a really useful tool to take back to your institution. Um, to think more more complexly about 
the environment that you create in your library. And I would encourage all of you to do that with your coworkers. So one question that I saw pop up is if we do any workshops for library staff and we have done several, um, but I'm not, we don't have any others currently planned um, at this point in time. Um, it is a labor of love. Um, it can be really difficult as transgender individuals to put our, to put in this emotional labor. Um, so we do not currently have um, any f continuing uh, workshops happening. Um, but again, we do have pretty copious amounts of resources mm. um, available to, uh, for you all to review on that tiny URL. Um, let's see, I'm looking for any other questions, making sure we didn't miss anything. If I, this is Reed again, and I just want to say in terms of trainings, um, I would, I think that's also important to know if your institutions or wherever you work, if, if your environment offers any trainings, and if you know that they don't, this is something to look into further. Um, I know that UW has um, the Q Center, which is the student run, um, like LGBTQ Center has a training that is for students, staff, and faculty that they do. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's big enough that it really can serve the whole campus well, but if your library doesn't have a training, um, figure out how to start one um, mm -hmm. and make it somewhat required for everybody to do. <laughs> this is Bean, and I just wanted to um, point out that um, Stephen mentioned there will be a presentation at the ALA this year on serving trans folks in libraries. So um, if you happen to be going, stay tuned for that. Um, okay. And in this last moment, there's a question. Should we assume if someone shares their gender identity or pronouns that this is how we'll refer to them as such in front of everyone? In other words, you know, how can you avoid outing people? Um, Katie, thanks for asking that question. I think it's um, very important. Uh, Everybody's take on this might be different. I'm, um, I'd be curious about um, like Reed and Sunny and Micah to chime in, but um, outing people is a, a very real danger when it comes to um, taking your, the information that you have about someone's gender identity and pronouns into future interactions. And if, if you think of it, I do think uh, it's perfectly respectful to, to ask when you, when you ask someone, hey, um, what pronouns do you use? Is to also say like, should I use those pronouns in front of our patrons? Or, you know, is it okay if I use these pronouns for you, you know, in the workroom? And that can, that can be just one quick way to, to get that information. And what I like to do when I, when I learn that someone's gender pronouns are different from what other people tend to use for them, um, sometimes I just until I can find out whether I would be outing them or not, I, I try to use their name exclusively rather than um, reveal a pronoun. And that way I'm doing what I can to respect the gender identity that I know them as um, without potentially outing them in front of people who um, they don't actually wanna share that information with. I think along, this is Reed again, and I think along with that, um, a really great practice is to ask people when they share their pronouns um, if, you, if they would like for you to correct other people mm -hmm. when, when they're either there or not there mm -hmm. is a really great practice. Um, some people don't want um, others to correct people when, when they get their pronouns wrong and other people feel very strongly, yes, please, please do correct people. Please inform people of what their pronouns are. So I would add that into the suite of um, tools that you are adding to your belt in terms of pronoun usage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A good example of what that might look like if you are correcting someone with consent of the person who is being referenced um, would be, let's say, uh, a colleague uses she pronouns to refer to someone that uses they pronouns. It might be like, hey, I don't know if you know, um, but this person actually uses they pronouns. Um, it's, it's honestly just that simple. Oh, that was Micah, by the way. 
Well, thank you all so much for sharing your morning with us. Um, as library workers, we all know how difficult it can be um, to have the time to do these things and to get our institutions to prioritize the time for us to do these things. Um, in this moment, Reed is the only one of us who's on the clock. So um, <laughs> we appreciate your time and uh, are doing this also as a labor of love. Um, and you have our information, um, and I think we got to all of the questions in the feed, um, and it sounds like uh, WSL will be sharing uh, not only the, this, the recording, but also the slides. So you will have access, or the, the chat, not the slides. I'm, well, the slides too, but you'll have access to all of this. And as you can see up here on your screen, um, we have our contact information, our email addresses, and um, we've, we've shared that information with you because we would really welcome um, any further questions that you think of, um, feedback that you have, um, ideas that you want to bounce. Um, and I, you know, and I said this in the chat just a moment ago, but particularly for uh, the trans folks who are in attendance today, we would love to hear from you, especially if you um, have ideas for how we can improve the information that we're presenting. Oh, and actually, here's another thing. Um, after our four hour session, we got some commitments uh, for action from folks. So people who were present, they said, I will do this. I will check to see if my library does this. I will do X, Y, Z. So if anybody who is still online and participating, if you want to take a minute and think about what action you can commit to going forward, not just, oh, I went to this cool webinar, the end. Um, think about one thing that you can implement that you learned today. Um, and, and that will spiral to bigger things. So thank you so much, everybody, for attending. <laughs>